Hey guys, let's go a little more in depth on the subject of rhetoric, in particular ethos, logos, and pathos. So just a little bit of a review right here at the beginning of class. So we talked about explicit versus implicit argumentation. Um, explicit is where the argument is directly stated and implicit is where it's more implied. So this is just kind of a language, explicit, implicit that you could use in doing the rhetorical analysis you're doing on your ads. We looked at a couple of, we looked at multiple examples actually in class. This is one that we looked at and which might have a more implicit idea to it. And this one, when it comes to the message to stop war, the argument here is very explicit, but there's always a mixture between implicit and explicit. But anyhow, it can be language that you look at uh, that might be helpful for you. Ethos, logos, and pathos. Ethos is grounded in the speaker's character, trustworthiness, reputation, credibility, anything like that. Logos is an appeal that's grounded in, uh, there's a typo, A, messages reason or reasoning. It's the logic of the argument. Uh, it can also use logical proofs to make its point. And pathos is grounded in the audience's emotion or imagination. And we looked a little bit just to try to make that more concrete in a way is to think about these characters from the Wizard of Oz and which one represents ethos, logos, pathos, and kairos. And we came to consensus that the cowardly want lion was more about ethos. Um, the tin man with his desire for a heart is about pathos. The straw man with his desire for a brain is logos. Oh, the cowardly lion wants courage. And Dorothy uh, is in some ways a representative of kairos because when she lands in the land of Oz, she lands at just the right time to squash one of the two main villains in the story. So let's talk a little bit about ethos. On one level, ethos is, is really quite simple, right? It relates to character. Um, but actually, there's a more complex understanding to ethos. Um, it does relate to character. It, it is essential to persuasion. And remember that ethos, logos, and pathos, when Aristotle was talking about them, he wasn't using these as terms for people to uh, use in analysis. He was using these as something to help people come up with arguments. So you would look to your character to try to persuade someone of whatever it is that you're trying to persuade them. So on one level, ethos is pretty simple. Um, it's part of the rhetorical triangle, ethos, logos, pathos. But, um, and also here's, I'm, I'm going to just show you a couple slides. You can stop here because maybe one of these slides will help you to think through um, how to do this kind of analysis. This one might be useful for you. Uh, if you're struggling a little bit with understanding these concepts, just pause the video here and take a look at something like this. None of these are perfect, but they can be helpful. So we talked in class. We looked at this really cool ad. You can look it up. It's Jason... Oh, I can't see his name, but it was a 2018 Missouri Democrat uh, advertisement. It was really cool, and it showed very much about ethos. The complexity of ethos. Ethos is a complex term and complex idea. It's a term and concept that has a 2,500-year history in the West. There's more than one definition and understanding. And as I've pointed out to you before, don't confuse ethos with ethics. All of these rhetorical terms, none of them are about morality or ethics. They're all about communication. So a good person can have a good ethos and a bad person in presenting a speech, in writing an essay. A bad person can construct his or her ethos in such a way that they persuade people. So they have a good ethos, not morally good. They're still stinkers. They're still awful human beings. But in terms of communication, they have successfully created an ethos that persuades people. So don't think of ethos as ethics or ethical because unethical people can have this communication trait, this communication skill and persuade people. Um, you also, when you think about ethos, I, we keep talking about it being character and it is character. But what is character? Different cultures and different times view it differently. Though probably all cultures view some things almost universally as good or bad. So I, I'm not aware of any culture that would view um, being a coward as a good thing. I think almost all cultures view 
courage as good. So what counts as character is, is a complexity, right? It's something that's, that's kind of complex. Um, yeah, every argument always comes down to Hitler. Hitler's horrible. He's one of the worst, absolute, horrible human beings that ever lived. He's terrible. He's rotten. He stinks. His message is hellish. It's demonic. It's satanic. It's stupid. Um, he costs the German people a horrendous toll on his own people that supposedly he was working for. He slaughtered people in the men's. He's horrible. Okay. I just want to emphasize just how horrible it is. His stupid anti-Semitism, um, his program against uh, the Roma, his program against the Poles, his program against Jehovah Witnesses and homosexuals. I mean, he is evil. Yet, he was able to construct an ethos that connected with his audience. So again, that's what I want to just emphasize. Ethos does not equal ethics. Unethical, immoral monsters like Hitler could still construct an ethos that unfortunately connects with a certain audience. Ethos can seem like it's this very deeply personal individual quality because you're talking about character, but actually it's very social. My understanding of character depends on the groups or on a society's understanding of character, which is why it can be really useful to see, to think about how a community constructs ethos. I'm, I'm a little bit off target. It's because I really find this topic really interesting and yet it's, it's complex. So in practice, creating a good ethos is always challenging. It's a challenging thing to do. Some scholars talk about situated versus invented ethos. It's a classic divide. Basically, situated means the character or the reputation that you bring to persuasion. Uh, if someone knows you're a good person, then they're going to evaluate what you say in light of their in light of your reputation and what you know. Invented ethos is the character you create to persuade in your text or speech. So you might think here of a time that you had to write a letter. Uh, to someone who didn't know you and how you um, got across who you are in a way that would connect with them. So if you're writing to get into a school, you might construct yourself as a hardworking student who always got A's and B's and so on. That's an invented ethos. And that's what we have to do in a lot of situations. We have to somehow, with words, get across to an audience uh, why they should trust us. That's invented ethos. You don't really need to know all that per se, I know, but I feel like it's something kind of interesting to talk about. So invented or situated, it's both. Um, we, in, in terms of communication, that's what works. When you're thinking about ethos also, if you see a celebrity in the ad, there's definitely some sort of ethos appeal that's going on. Logos, we've talked about this a bit. So logos, and when you think about it in two basic sense, senses, all arguments, even illogical ones, have a logic or reasoning to it. Uh, Webster's Dictionary gives this particular definition of it here. You can pause and read that for yourself. Um, in doing rhetorical analysis, you want to discover what that logic or reasoning is. Even if you disagree with it, even if it's wrong, even if it's offensive, uh, all ads will have a logos to it. So don't say in your analysis papers, there is no logos in here. There is a logos. There is a reasoning. Identify it. Now, it might not have a strong um, appeal to like logical arguments. There might not be statistics and numbers and all that kind of stuff, but it does have a reasoning and you should state what that reasoning is. Your rhetorical analysis, RA, I'm, I'm abbreviating, isn't an opinion piece. It's an analysis of the ad's rhetoric. How does the ad attempt to persuade? And every ad is going to have some sort of logic or reasoning to it. Find it, state it. If the ad might do more with pathos, that's fine. But um, you need to at least identify what the overall reasoning of the ad is. Some ads, though, are going to make more of what we commonly consider a logical appeal. So in your analysis, look for appeals to logic. And what do logical appeals look like? Um, you know, surveys, facts, percentages, those kinds of things. Uh, don't worry about, don't worry about uh, logical fallacies. I don't even find that conversation really all that helpful. <laughs> you can if you want, but it's, you know, eh, 
whatever. So to sum up, every ad has a basic logic or reasoning to it. What is it? And some ads make logical appeals uh, that we would normally think of. That is, they try to come across as all logical. Um, this particular one, here's another example of, of logos. There's definitely pathos here for sure, but it's also very much logos driven, I would say. Because if you can look here, all the items listed on the left, I mean, that's just basically a listing of facts. This is what happens if you smoke. So it's got a very significant logical appeal there, but it's also very much uh, pathos driven. I mean, there's a gun, cigarettes, uh, the color black here is very striking. Pathos is the one we spent some more time on in class. This was an ad we looked at from the Second World War, British context where the Nazis were bombing London. Uh, so you have a statement there, deliver us from evil, which is, of course, from the Lord's Prayer, the most famous prayer really in Scripture besides the 23rd Psalm, I would think. Um, definitely there's pathos going on here. I mean, you have at the very heart and center of this ad, you have a child who's crying. That is absolutely pathos. When you're thinking about pathos, it's incredibly important to have it. You should look at this little sweet ad for Otis. But people sometimes think that pathos can be manipulative. They can think it, it's irrational. And it can be. It can be manipulative. It can be irrational. Um, you could, we talked about whether Otis was manipulative, although I don't think it's irrational. Um, we looked at these couple ads in class and discussed whether or not they were more manipulative. Maybe, um, but they're not irrational. These, none of the ads I've just shown you in the last few seconds, the Otis ad, the doggy, and these for the insurance, those aren't irrational. I mean, there's, they're very clearly rational points that they're making. So when you're thinking about pathos, why they can manipulate and be rational, they're not inherently either. In fact, we don't operate by logic alone. That's not how human beings operate. We operate emotionally. And I shared with you in class the results of this neurologist's work um, where he showed basically these people who had had significant brain injuries, unfortunately, that affected their ability to have emotions. And that lack of emotions did not make them logical super machines it actually negatively affected their ability to make decisions and all sorts of consequences to it. I only say this, y'all, to say this. Sometimes people get all angry about emotional arguments. You're just being emotional. Well, don't just be emotional, but in any argument, you really should make some appeal to the audience's emotions because humans are emotional. Um, that's part of who we are. It can be a healthy thing. So let me just pause there for the day. I'll, we'll carry on with another mini lecture later. Thanks, y'all.